Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be doing a talk about Timeline and Cinemachine, mixing gameplay with interactive cutscenes. Um, this is going to be an hour-long talk. Um, I actually hate PowerPoints. So most of it's going to be in the editor. I hope that's OK. <laughs> it's like four people like, yeah. The rest are like, no, we love PowerPoint. We, we've come to an Adobe conference. Um, no, Microsoft conference, yeah. So this talk is going to be a lot about how Timeline and Cinemachine can be used, not specifically for cinematics or specifically for some type of movie, but more for little gameplay sequences, little micro clips, little things happening like a lightning strike takes place and you want to place that at a point in time. Or you walk up to a character and then you have a conversation with that character, all these tiny little cutscenes. So my name is Andy Touch. Um, I've been traveling Europe and some of the world for about four years. So you've probably seen me and my terrible jokes before. Um, I'm a product content evangelist at Unity. So my parents think I've joined a cult. And Unity is very cult-like, as well as all the people that use Unity. Um, but basically, my job is to play around with new features. Like I've been using Timeline for probably two years now in various phases. Um, learn them, understand them inside out, back to front, uh, and then present them and show people how to use them. This is why I'm standing here right now. I'm also on Twitter, where I just post weird GIFs of things. So I'm going to talk mostly about Timeline and Cinemachine. But these aren't just the features I'm going to talk about. These are the main focus ones. Um, like in the keynote, they're called hero features. Um, I'm going to talk about how these hook into lots of different areas of Unity, particles, audio mixing system, various other bits and pieces. So everyone's probably here seen the Adam demo, which is the cinematic that our Stockholm demo team created, um, showing Adam the robot sort of waking up, coming out, and then meeting these two robots. Um, they told me that basically everything in this whole demo and sequence was sequenced with Timeline, uh, with timeline or as an, it was called Director at the time. And that means everything, the characters moving, the camera shots, uh, particles, all the different bits and pieces, even the lighting. And one thing I want to get across in this talk is Timeline is fantastic for doing animations for characters and animations for different things, but it can be used so much more. It can pretty much touch any part of the engine. You could even bind it to something as ridiculous as the terrain system or the wind zone and things like that and be able to control and script and manage or just tweak lots of different uh, elements over time. So the talk is called Timeline Cinemachine, Mixing Gameplay with Interactive Cutscenes. And whilst this is true, cutscenes is just kind of a small sub-segment of the amount of things you can do with Timeline. I'm going to show a day, simple day-night cycle, a weather system. I wouldn't call these cutscenes. I would call these sequences. So I've kind of ad-libbed this bit here. So I'm going to show how you can use Timeline for cutscenes, but also for overarching kind of parallel timelines. And timelines inside timelines inside timelines, and it all gets very inception-y at a point. So we have like a traditional cutscene where a hero wakes up and then a hero fights enemies. So you would have the original cutscene of the hero waking up. I play a lot of Zelda, so you'll get a lot of Zelda references in this. And then uh, the hero then fighting enemies is sort of the next thing. And Timeline does this very, very well. You have your two sort of sections. And then you have something I call embedded cutscene. There's probably a much more scientific term for this, uh, where you have gameplay of a hero moving around an environment uh, and interacting with different things. And then when the hero enters a room, again, a Zelda reference, it kicks off a timeline of a boss. And this timeline has many different things. One is a boss appearing. One is the boss animating. Particles appear. UI pops up. You are now fighting this dragon. Uh, the camera cuts to the hero. The hero pulls out a sword. Then you then have the boss fight. So you kind of have timelines spliced in between different sections of your game. And I'll call these parallel sequences. So we have gameplay of a hero exploring a city. And then you have some kind of like parallel sequences taking place. These aren't necessarily cutscenes because you don't trigger them off when you enter a room or pick up an object. But these are basically sequences such as a day-night day cycle where something happens over time, the lighting changes and adapts, street lamps may turn on, or a weather cycle, lightning storm happening and things like that. So you can actually stack all of these things together using the timeline system. For example, as the hero is exploring the city, you may walk into a room which triggers off a mini timeline at the same time as the day-night day cycle, at the same time as the weather is sequencing in the background. So you, like I said, you have timelines inside timelines inside timelines, almost as if they're nested timelines. And somewhat, I'd bet that I'd say the word nested and no one would laugh. Yeah. So I'm actually going to switch out of PowerPoint and show you basically all those examples, maybe not a city, but day-night, day cycles, weather systems, and things like that. So I built this very small demo. Um, this demo is an environment you can walk around as a character. 
I'll be making this demo available at some point, maybe not today, but like in a couple of days. Everything I show you will be in a package you can take, digest, hack apart, do all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, for me to kind of clarify a bit more about the people in this room, um, put your hand up if you're an artist or an animator. OK, that's a really cool junk. Wow, nice. Uh, put your hand up if you're a programmer or developer. You copy paste code. Um, OK. OK, that's cool. Put your hand up if you're an audio, uh, audio designer, audio developer. OK. Put your hand up if you work in QA. Technically, everyone should put their hand up, but that's fine. Um, put your hand up if you're a game designer, so it's your job to kind of annoy everyone in the team and change everything. OK, cool. All right. Put your hand up if you use Unity. At this point, everyone's kind of woken up at this point uh, after the party last night. So I have this environment, and this is taking using assets from the Adventure Game Project, which was used at Unite Training Day last year and various other demos. And if I go into play mode, you'll notice that we have our character or our protagonist using the Cinemachine free look camera to basically look around. And I'm sure um, that Adam and Mike in the previous session showed this off about orbiting, they might show a mouse or something like that. So I've got this all set up um, to follow the character. And the character has a state machine to run, walk around, kind of do a bit of a goofy jump. And in this environment, you have all these kind of spots that you can walk up to and trigger off mini timelines. And the purpose of this demo is that each of these would show off a different feature of timeline and cinema machine integrated together. I have lots of other things to show you, but what I want to do first is to leave play mode and kind of show how some of these timelines are set up. If we go to this uh, coffee bot guy. So what we have here is on, this, on each of these NPCs, we have its own timeline. So our coffee bot has its own timeline. Our character has its own timeline. Uh, a dog that we're going to walk up to and it's going to do something has its own timeline. So one thing you can do with timeline is place it on lots of different entities so they have their own mini sequences and mini data that they play back and sequence over time. And it's very flexible. You can change lots of different elements of this. You can notice that these playable directors aren't set to play on a wake. So rather than the intro cutscene where something happens at the beginning, basically this is going to trigger when we uh, walk into a zone and push a key. Very simple. And I have a timeline playback manager, which I'll uh, also share as well uh, with the project, which basically does a lot of things. It does things like, do you want to only play the timeline once? What's the interaction key? Does it set the player's position? For example, if the player is facing away from a character and you push a key, you don't want the player to be talking in the wrong direction, right? That doesn't make any sense. Um, does UI pop up and all sorts of bits and pieces like that? Now, if I select this coffee bot, you'll notice that this coffee bot has a timeline sequence um, to do with how we interact with it. And as you've seen before in the keynote, you can scrub through this timeline and see all the different things that the coffee bot does. Now, this talk is going to include a lot of gotchas and kind of a lot of little things and tips and tricks to do with these systems. So in the keynote, in Adam Mike's talk, they're kind of looking at more high level. This is going to be lots of tiny little, oh, did you know you could do this, um, like tricks as well. So one thing you'll notice is that we instantly had a transition in the camera from the point of view of our character to the point of view next to our um, Coffee bot. So as we scrub through, you'll notice the camera in the editor goes from behind our character using that free look Cinemachine rig, this point of view here. And you can even see it as I scrub through this camera moving into position. Now, one thing you can do is you can place each virtual camera generated by Cinemachine as separate clips on a Cinemachine track. And you've probably seen this many times before. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that with this long Cinemachine clip, we can have an ease in and an ease out duration without having to loop to another clip. So what that does is timeline will override the current virtual camera being used. It will blend it in. And we can move from a free look camera that's following our character into a static camera very, very easily by setting this value here. For example, if this I said it's to be 0, it's going to be an instant cut. But here, it's going to blend very smoothly from our gameplay camera to our fixed point camera for our cutscene. In this sequence, our coffee bot uh, salutes. And then we get to a point where our coffee bot creates coffee for our character. I try to make it kind of topical towards all game developers, because every studio I visited, they always offer me coffee first. That's like the very first thing. Oh, sign the NDA, then the coffee. Um, yeah. So what we have here is you can sequence many different areas. So we have our coffee bot that animates. He has an animation clip, or it has an animation clip 
of him reaching behind and making coffee. And a trick that I've used is the coffee cup that he's going to grab is actually attached into his hand, but disabled. And with the timeline track, you'll notice we have an activation track. We can use that to turn on and off game objects at specific points. So using the sequencer, I was very able to easily place a coffee cup in his hand as he reaches behind, enable the coffee cup, pull it out, and then it has it like so, as you can see like this. He's going to reach behind. It is enabled. The tricks of video games, right? Turning stuff on and off. Another thing that the coffee bot does is spew out particles. And that's been kind of a big thing that a lot of people have been asking me when it comes to do with sequencing and timeline, is how do we place particles to emit a certain point? And I use kind of the dragon example. Uh, you could have a timeline that looks up to a dragon. The dragon then breathes fire, so you want particles to spawn at that point. The camera goes to a house. Particles, like a fireball, appears at the house, and all these different things. And timeline includes a track dedicated to not just particles, but controlling elements over time. And this is called the control track. I'm kind of going over a couple of things that aren't necessarily shown before or elsewhere. So the control track allows you to bind it to a particle system and play a particle system at a specific point in time. So once you have that in place, you don't have to write code to say, wait two seconds to play the particle system, wait five seconds. Oh, our artist has made the particle system longer or shorter. You can instead place it along the sequence for when the particle system takes place. And of course, right, everyone's going to laugh at this probably, but because I've said that, no one's going to laugh at it now. Um, we have this um, coffee particle system control track. And if we go over here, we have the clip for this particular particle system. And this particular particle system is the coffee bot creating coffee. It definitely is, trust me. It's a, it's a coffee machine, right? But as you can see here, as I'm scrubbing through, we have the particles playing back. And I have some examples of some thunderstorms and things later on sequenced with this. So you, have, you can have animated characters, you can have audio, and you can also have particles all sequenced within timeline. A little bit later on, I'll show you timeline, sequence by timeline, sequence by timelines. But I'm going to like ramp up to that, because uh, it gets a little confusing uh, a little bit. So here we have our coffee bot creates the coffee. And then another thing that happens is that the activation track ends. So the activation track for the coffee cup is only there for the duration that the clip is live. So when the activation track ends, that's at the point that the character takes the object, and then it disappears. And as you can see, he says, ta-da, here's my coffee. It disappears. And then the coffee bot goes back to what he's usually doing, and then he closes. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that as I've been sequencing through, I've been focusing on the coffee bot and what is the character actually been doing. The character is still over here. And this is going to look a little weird, but basically the character is over here. And then the character takes the object. That's partly because this character is a dynamic object. It's a player that moves around the environment. It's not going to always be standing in front of the coffee machine. So sometimes when you're sequencing two things, like a character passing an item from A to B in this example, or a character opening a door, you may need to place the character at that location or animate it to go to that location and then to simulate that one-to-one. Uh, -one. But here we have our character taking the object at this exact point. So you can see just here, she takes it, and it disappears in the background, and she puts it in her pocket, which doesn't seem very, doesn't seem very safe, but that's, uh, yeah. Another trick that you can use with Timeline is um, override tracks. So you saw in the keynote an animation track which had various clips along it. And these clips are, for example, animation data created elsewhere, Maya Max. You can bring them in, trim them, clip them, do all sorts of things. But one thing you may want to do is you may want to have, at a point, a character do something that's not part of their current animation track. In this case, our character is standing there idly not really doing anything. So it's kind of like an idle animation. And then at a specific point, we want her to pick up the cup from the other character's hand. That's why, with animation tracks, you can add an override track. And what this does is it basically plays this top root human idle animation. And at that exact point, you just drag and drop the animation clip on. It's then going to cut to this take object clip, and then it's going to go back to this idle. So one example could be a cutscene of a character running, and you just have her constantly running. 
and then an override track where they then like look over their shoulder and then look back. So you don't want to add clip, 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 and then kind of you know have to play with clips. You can add override tracks to very, very, very quickly blend between one animation and another one. There's a slight issue with this, but you can fix it by putting in a couple of numbers. One thing you'll notice is that we have the human's idle animation, and then when it gets this override track, she kind of snaps. Do you see? Like her foot instantly snaps to this position. She takes it, and then at the very end, it's more noticeable. Doesn't look too fluid. So what we could do is we could go back, re-record this mocap data, re-record this animation, re-import it and tweak it. Instead, we can actually blend from animation track, the override track, to the animation track, similar to how you can blend from one state in the animator to another state in the animator. So we take this take object clip. We go up to here. We have an ease in, ease out duration. Let's just set it to like 0.2. And what you'll notice here is we now have a tiny little blend. And if we look at our character, you can see her feet actually slide into position. And they go back to normal. So it looks a lot better. The character's less jumpy. And just by entering tiny little numbers, we can blend and smoothly have our character taking this particular coffee. Another thing I want to point out is the audio track. And it's very, very powerful because it hooks into Unity's audio mixing system. So one thing we try to do with Timeline is not just tie into specific areas, but allow it to be very open so it can hook into particles, into audio mixing, into animation, and audio, and things like that. So what we have is an audio track. We have clips along the audio track. I have one of kind of the robot saying some uh, gibberish, one of a cup sound of him picking up a cup, one of the coffee steam, um, and one of a ding of a bell. And you can place multiple animation, uh, audio clips onto this audio track. And one thing you might notice is that the timeline track binds to an audio source. So if we find this audio source, this can be output to an audio mixer. So you can see that if you use the Unity's audio mixing system, you can also apply effects and different things to your audio tracks in your game. So you can distort the audio, change it. I think in this, I add a slight pitch-like shift. So our robot sounds a little less normal and a bit more, I guess, like robotic, um, probably. Um, and once we go into play mode, we can then see this change happen. So we have our character walking around. Well, now she's walking around. I walk into this trigger zone, and you notice it's going to say, press E to talk, or press E to animate, or press E to do something. And this is then going to hit play. It's going to go to the timeline and do timeline.play, kind of like an audio source.play, or like an animation.play. It's going to do exactly the same thing. It's also going <coughs> to sorry, disable the player's input so you don't run around the cutscene. But you can actually, timeline by default lets you run around cutscenes, which is the thing everyone always wants to do. You kind of had to do the extra work to disable input from the character. So by default, you can have cutscenes where your character just runs away in the middle of a character talking to you, it's, which is actually pretty cool. So as we hit E, we have our robot. Yeah, and then pulls out a cup. She takes it, put it in her pocket, and then at the end of the mini cutscene, it then closes, and then you notice the camera transitioned back to our free look. So we've done a tiny little embedded cutscene, hooking into lots of things in Unity, just by writing a few lines of codes to detect when you're inside a zone and when you hit play. And that script I'll just distribute so everyone can do that anyway. There's a couple other things I would like to point out. One is you can extend timeline. So if you are an artist or a developer, an, an artist or a um, animator who doesn't want to write code and you work with a programmer, you can get them to actually extend timeline to improve kind of like functionality of it. And one thing that a lot of people ask about is a simple conversation system, two characters talking back and forth. So this could be with uh, audio or it could instead be with text. So what I've got here is an example of a playable that um, I wrote earlier on and I can use to actually build up a conversation between two characters um, just by using this playable that's already pre-written. And the really exciting thing about this is when this whole system is uh, like released, well, it's, it's in beta now, so you can download it right now, is all the wild and wonderful things the Unity community make, because they really kind of go to town with all the crazy things that is done. And we're going to see things that we never even assumed someone would be possible to do. And it's amazing, because the Unity community tends to share all that as well. So they have all that on the asset store saying, hey, here's an entire dialogue system for your whole game. 
you just plug it in and change the text, and it automatically handles everything, which is a little scary, but also pretty cool as well. So if we go to this shark-like character who's uh, working at this fish stall. We have a timeline as well. And here we have a conversation track. And this conversation track is part of the kind of the Playables API. I'm not going to show you the Playables API, because James Boutley, one of our programmers on our, our new content team, is going to give a whole one-hour deep dive talk about this tomorrow. And I don't want to steal his thunder, because he's a, he's a genius. He's probably here chuckling away, or not at this talk. That's fine. And what we have here is we have a clip. And this clip does a couple of things. One is we can set data of what happens at this specific clip. So if you work with someone in your team who wants to extend timeline to do conversations and things like that, you can say, hey, could you write me a clip that sets the text at specific blocks? So here we have a conversation track. We can directly preview what's going to happen. So we have our little UI box that pops up. We're saying, hello, what do you have for sale? He then says, red herring and radioactive tuna. And you notice that that data is happening for those individual clips. So you can actually piece together clips that happen at certain points. So I could take her, um, duplicate that clip. So she says, hello, what do you have for sale? Sharkman says, red herring and radioactive tuna. And then it's going to go back to her. And then we can change in this box you know, kind of what she says. Uh, so let's say, no thanks, I prefer um, Stroop Waffle. No one here from uh, Netherlands then? No, OK. So you can see here that as we scrub through, hello, what do you have for sale? Red Hanger, Red to Tuna. No thanks, I would prefer Stroop Waffle. So we can piece together these little clips and have all these conversations taking place very, very quickly. And another thing you can do with this is you can say to uh, programmers or developers, hey, could you make the text box red or expose a value for me to use? And they can sort of create all these tools that allow you to very quickly build different uh, sections. So if we go in and play this, again, it's using this uses exactly the same script as the other one. We have a quick cut. Hello, what do you have for sale? And she's animating uh, that using the blending as well. No thanks, I prefer Street Waffle. And he's like, OK, whatever, and then goes back to normal. So you can see that using Timeline, you can in also sort of build kind of, or work with your team to build little functions or little functionality that will help sort of things uh, uh, be easier to, to create um, and a lot quicker. So also in this scene is a couple of other things. One is the dolly track. And I think uh, Adam showed the dolly track earlier on. Um, so what we have here is we have a dolly track that, as we walk up to this sequence, it kicks off the dolly track to animate along a path, and then the camera blends back to our main free look camera. If I go to the, uh, the VR salesman, he's selling retro VR tech, um, and have a look at his timeline, all it is is virtual cameras and then the animation of those virtual cameras. And you'll notice that we have the trick here. We blend from our free look camera to our uh, virtual camera. And then we have an animation along the timeline of the camera fading through, looking at different points of interest, and looking at the fruit at the end. And that's all animated entirely on timeline as well. Because you can animate on timeline, have a look at it here, and you can see that we're actually animating the, vir the movement of that virtual camera along that path all directly out of the box. And we get to the end like so. The other cool thing with Timeline, this is kind of another really nice, I'm trying to pick out like all the tiny little tricks, is the animation track. You can actually double click on it, and it opens it out in the animation window. Uh, some of you might have seen it. You're chuckling, so you've probably seen this before. Um, if I then dock it somewhere, um, what you'll notice is that this animation window is basically that, that little animation tricks context, but in the animation window preview. So you can specifically focus on a specific animation, because talking to animators, they always want to focus on one tiny little piece of their big uh, sequence, and then pull it out, see what, how it looks, and then uh, dive back in. But what you can notice is that as you kind of make changes, so let's say we go to this point here and move this here, you can notice that it will actually update the uh, tracks, and you can scrub through it, and it will move the playhead. So the an it hooks into the animation window as well in working side by side. So you have the timeline track working with the animation window. 
makes it quite easy to say, at this point, you know, maybe have a UI element pop up saying spices cost 50 euros, or it's very expensive, but yeah. Let's show you something else. So here we have a dog who's looking very uh, t p o s y um, Another key thing that you want to do when you're blending between gameplay and uh, sequences is um, perhaps maintain control of your player. Um, actually, probably what's better if I show this is with the, uh, with the sh Shark Man conversation. If we go to the Shark Man conversation, in this timeline playback manager, if we untick disable player input so our player can still run around the environment, and we go to our player, And let's mute the tracks because you can go to specific tracks and mute them if you, if you want to sort of see what it looks like with the track or see what it looks like without the track. So let's mute that and let's mute uh, that as well. And let's turn that off as well. By default, Timeline won't disable the player's input if you kick off a mini embedded cutscene. So by default, you can have things like. And then. You can have sort of interactive cutscenes. So our character is kind of running around there, not really paying attention to what's going on. And then the cutscene will phase back. That's by default. And that seems to be the thing lots of people want to use for cutscenes nowadays. Rather than the controls that are gone from the player, they want the player to still move around the environment as a boss appears, kind of Dark Souls style or a Shadow Colossus style as well. So that's pretty cool. You're not locked into uh, disabling player input. Now, with this dog, it's kind of the same thing. So, what we want to do is we want to blend into looking at a particular target.、And、this is very common in something like Assassin's Creed, when you walk to a point and the camera moves to kind of the shoulder of your player, looking at a particular focal point, like a treasure chest or a pickup or, or Assassin's,、uh, Assassin's Creed, something you have to assassinate. Some form of sequence happens and then the camera blends back all seamlessly whilst your player can still move. And this is、uh, using a Cinemachine、um, setup called the Group Target. So, Cinemachine allows you to focus on one specific target and follow that, in this case, the player. What we want to do is we want to keep the dog in the center of the screen, but have the、um, character kind of in the corner of the screen、um, on the very edge. I'll show you what it looks like, and then I'll sort of show you the, the one component you add to basically do this automatically. So, this dog actually has a big collider zone using that same script that I showed before, but rather than hitting a key, you just walk in and it triggers off the timeline automatically. So, as I walk into this collider zone, the camera's going to zoom in, look at the dog, but still keep the player in the view. And then the camera will pan out into that sequence.、So、you can see that you can move into environments, the camera focuses on a particular element, and then the、uh, player is then kept within that side of the,、uh, within the、um, bounds of the screen. I can go into this camera and Show you kind of what it does. Let's set the priority of the camera really high and let's move around so that I can kind of show you exactly how it works. So, what we have here is we have a Cinemachine camera,、uh, Cinemachine component called Group. And with it, you give multiple targets. In this case, I have the dog as a target and I have the player's shoulders, I think, as a target as well. And what it will do is it will try to keep both of those within the view of the camera because there's not much point in focusing on the dog whilst your character keeps running and then you see your character in the distance when that's the main thing you're controlling. And with this, you can set different priorities. In this case, the dog has a priority of one, whereas the character has a priority of like 0.2, 0.3. And you can then specify how,、uh, what these sort of bounds is of the character around the edge of the screen. Now, I warn you, by default, it's set to zero, so the character appears literally on the edges of the screen, but you can set that bounds directly in Cinemachine to sort of edge the character slightly in. So, as you can see here, the dog is pretty much in the center of the screen, and as the character walks around, it's keeping her within that sort of view. If I then go back to the、uh, dog target group, Here is the one component you need to add. You can get the average position of all the targets. So, a good example is an RTS game. If you have 20 sort of like units moving along in a sequence, you could, for example, set all those 20 in the group, but give the priority to kind of the,、uh, the leader of the group, like a, a banner carry or something like that. But then it still keeps the others within the view. And the camera will adjust in size,、uh, 
uh, uh, position and things like that to basically keep all those things within the, uh, the, the render, I guess. And here we have the dog with a weight of 1 and the player with a weight of 0.1. Uh, and you can set different things. So if we want the character kind of a little bit on the edge of the view, we can tweak a value and then very, very quickly uh, go into play mode and sort of show you that she's more on the edge of the screen now. So you can specify things like over the shoulder, up above, and you can blend in between different sort of sequences or interactive cutscenes because the character's still moving um, whilst a sequence happening. And the other really cool thing is you can see this bounding box sort of expand uh, between the different groups. So as I move towards the dog, you can notice that it's getting bigger and sort of adjusting size. So you can actually visualize what's actually in that group. So as I move further away, you see that it stretches. And you can visualize just in case something's outside and you want to think, why is it doing that? Why is it uh, you know, not keeping everything within the particular view? Uh, what else do I have? Another thing you can do is during a sequence, you can also use Cinemachine to give your camera kind of an orbit uh, control around this particular cutscene. So for the, um, the shark example and the coffee bot example, um, the camera went to a fixed point, and you couldn't really look around or look at the conversation happening. But in games like uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild, another like Zelda reference, whilst the conversation's happening, you can move kind of the camera around to look at it at different points. So what we have here is we have uh, this lovely gentleman here, and he's selling parts of Androids. Um, and he's a second-hand salesman, which is a terrible joke. Um, and what you'll notice on his timeline is he has a reference to one clip of a camera. If we go to this clip of a camera, it's using a free look rig. And this is a free look rig that we have for our character, which is this kind of rolled cage around, uh, around her, if I select her. So you notice that we have this big red roll cage of how the camera is going to orbit around um, our main punk girl. But if you have a look over at this point of view, or this, uh, this area, we can have a look at this virtual camera. And let's solo it. And you can see that the red rings are then placed around this particular area. You don't want to be too high or too low, but this is the orbit. So instead of blending between a free look orbit camera to a fixed point, we're blending from a free look camera to another free look camera, and we can actually look around this mini cutscene that takes place. Let's go back into play mode and have a look how this looks. So we go into here, we hit E. The camera then moves to this point, but using Cinemachine, we can then have, they don't really do anything, they're, they're haggling very silently. But you notice that we can then have the camera set up to zoom into different points. So we could even have the point of view from the shop salesman. Um, so we can almost have a cutscene that we look around some kind of sequence taking place um, and see what it actually looks like from different angles. I want to show you one or two other cool bits and pieces. Um, let's have a look at some more particles. Actually, let's do day-night. So what I have here is I have a day-night day night cycle uh, game object, which I'll enable now. On this has a playable director, which is the uh, timeline component to play a timeline within the scene. And this is referencing many different things. And you can see that it sets to play on awake, so we don't walk into a zone and we do dot .play to trigger it off. But instead, we have it playing on awake, and we get it to loop. So when the timeline gets to the end, it's going to loop back around to the beginning and play again, which is quite typical of a day-night cycle, because that's uh, reality, right? That's uh, how day-night cycles work. If we then go to this day-night cycle, we've got a couple of things that we can look at. One is this is a custom track that I've written that hooks into the skybox. So you can write playables and custom tracks, or get your developers to write playables and custom tracks, and say to them, hey, could you write me something that hooks into, for example, uh, the wind zone, or hooks something that hooks into the light, or hooks something, uh, write something that hooks into uh, a render texture, or something, or all sorts of different components and assets, and expose something to do with that. In this case, this is going to the skybox, which is this nice, lovely, blue Unity uh, view. And then over the duration of the clip, it's fading to night. And what I'm doing is I'm triggering off code at the beginning of the clip, triggering off code at the end of the clip, and triggering off code over the duration of the clip. So what I'm doing is I've basically 
if, if I was working with a developer, I'd say, hey, could you make a playable that sets the skybox over time to blend between different values? They could write this, trigger off code at these different points, and then have this system in place. And because we can get the data of the duration of a clip, we can extend it, make it large, make it fade instantly, make it fade slow. And we already have all that logic in place. We just need to adjust it uh, to see how it looks um, in our scenario. So in this case, on the clip, we go to the shader property of exposure, which is basically the exposure of the skybox. And we start at 1.3. I'm going to go to 0. So as I scrub through, you'll notice that the skybox will then fade. And eventually gets to ignore those lights for the time being, and I'll explain that a little bit. But you can notice that over the duration of the clip, the exposure then fades down. And we then have an almost pitch black scene because we're changing that skybox. Let's say I wanted this to be very, very quick. I could then, it's going to be a lot more, uh, a lot faster. That doesn't really seem good. But if I space it out over time, we get a really nice kind of skybox fade. So you can use timeline to sequence not just kind of little cutscenes or little interactive moments, but also sort of bigger, more complex uh, things that change a lot of areas of your game. Here we have an animation for the light intensity. So you can not only animate position, rotation, scale, but also uh, properties on objects, uh, properties on components, such as the light intensity. And here we also have a track group, which is kind of a way to store or sort um, lots of different tracks. And inside here, we have the activation track turning on all these different light cones from these street lights. So if I now run through this sequence entirely, we have it fading out, fading the skybox over time. Street lights turn on. We have our sequence playing as usual. Um, obviously, our character's running around in this environment. And when it gets to the end, we then have a fade back up with another clip uh, with the values switched in terms of the exposure. The street lights turn on, and then we're back into our scene. So this was all done entirely in uh, timeline. And the really cool thing is you can have this playing whilst you're kicking off these mini cutscenes. So if I now play this, we have our character. Day and night is uh, faded. Our character can still walk around. You can still go up to the coffee bot and order, the cof order a coffee. But you can see that you can have this day night cycle. Sorry. Um, you can see that you can have this cutscene happening whilst this day night cycle is happening in the background and kind of stack up all your different cutscenes at the same time. And you can see that it's now faded in. So you can have timelines all happening at the same time in lots of different ways. Oh, and it's gone back to day night because it's looping as well which is pretty cool. So we have this simple day-night cycle, which is put together very, very quickly, or I previously put together very quickly. So another thing we want to do is sequence particles. So here we have a storm timeline. This is also playing on a wake. It's happening at the beginning. We're not triggering at a certain point. It's also looping, because we want this weather system to loop over and over again. And one very key thing with this is we have lots of tracks for different lightning strikes. Now, each of these is a control track. And rather than it going to a particle system, it's going to another timeline. So if you think of it, we have these tiny little mini timelines, and we have this kind of master timeline that's playing in them at points. So if you use After Effects, it's kind of like compositions nested inside compositions. Here, we have timelines nested into timelines. So yes, timeline supports nested timelines in this controlled way. You can't drag and drop timelines onto the timeline at, at this current point, but you can trigger them off at certain points so they sequence together. If I enable one of these and show you what it looks like, and it's this one here, so we have this point where a lightning strike is going to happen, you'll notice that we can actually scrub through and see what this lightning strike looks like and rewind it over time. So here we have a lightning strike playing using a control tracks. And the cool thing is that we can like pause it and then fly around these, this lightning strike and see what it looks like kind of paused in the context of our scene. Pretty cool, right? Maybe? Yeah. So you can see that we have our particle system, um, and we can pause it, and we can basically see how it is. So we could tweak our particle system to be, actually, I think these lines are sort of too wide, too small. 
rather than hitting simulate over and over again, going into play mode and waiting for a lightning strike, we can actually kind of use timeline as kind of a preview or a scrubbing preview of the particle systems. Now, we have this mini timeline of this lightning strike taking place. Now, the cool thing with timeline is it stores it as an asset and all the clip data as an asset. So if we have six or seven different timelines, we can put the lightning strike timeline on all of them, and they will all reference this timeline. So if I tweak something like play this flash at a later point, so you see the flash was a later point after the particles are created, you, that will stem to all the instances of this timeline in the terms of the other lightning strikes. So that's the mini timeline. If we go back to our storm, we have all these control playable asset clips. These are all referencing, and if I select one of them, the other timelines. So they're referencing them and saying, over the duration of this clip, play this mini sub timeline. And as I scrub through the, uh, the timeline, you can notice that we basically have lightning striking at certain points. And it's the same, oh, we have rain as well, but you can see here that we have this particular clip here, and we can pause it and see all the different sort of moments that are happening uh, at this point in time. Similarly, where I can pull this along to, say, here, and fly around the rain that's currently in our scene. Let's actually, that didn't work. Let's go to like here. We can then fly around and see the rain, kind of, I guess, matrix style and all the different elements that are happening here. So you can kind of piece together and play and play around with your particles to see if they look right uh, within this uh, sequence. And similarly, what I could do is I could position and re, uh, readjust where these particles play. So if I take these particles and put that there, duplicate that, put that there. So I'm basically going to make all the lightning strike at exactly the same time. And then let's have multiple lightning strikes from there. As I scrub through, You see that you can sequence lots of particles very, very quickly and get them to play at all sorts of different points. And let's move a couple of these back. So now, when I go into play mode, we then have particles or a storm sort of weather. If we walk around, you can see that we then have the rain, which is also being sequenced, and we animate the rate of the rain, and then all these like mini timeline lightning strikes taking place. So we have a timeline controlling mini timelines. Um, I hope someone's counted the number of times I said timeline, because it's going to be a world record. And then you see that the rain fades over time, and then that timeline loop will loop back to the beginning, and eventually our rain will then, yep, it's coming back all of a sudden. And the really cool thing is, is that whilst you're playing in play mode, you can actually see the little um, timeline playhead actually at specific points. So you can see here, we can actually see at this point, the lightning strikes take place, and they're all sequencing. So you can actually see at this level, and you can sort of position things and move it here. Actually, I want this to be here. Actually, I want this to play at this point. You can then readjust how your sequence looks, both in edit mode, but also at runtime as well. And the other really cool thing is that you can um, scrub it to a point, let's say like here, and then if I increase this view, well, let's do it when we have a nice lightning strike like so. And you see that we can actually pause the, uh, yeah, this is truly interactive, right? You can see this, and you can run around this paused timeline and kind of see what it looks like at certain points, which is kind of uh, like a visualizer of the timeline, I guess. But whilst this is paused, you can also go and like, interact with all the different other cutscenes because we have all these, this timeline paused, but the other ones are still you know, active and going to be playing at some point. Now, just to confuse things even more, not really, so we have this storm timeline, which controls all the mini lightning strike timelines. If we enable this day-night cycle, what we have here is a weather control timeline. So we can now take the day-night cycle and the weather timeline and put the weather con timeline controlled by the day-night cycle. So we kind of have an overarching day-night cycle, then a mini weather timeline, then lots of tiny little lightning timelines. So we kind of have lots of tiers. So you can break up all your different pieces into different moments and then sequence them all together. And that's pretty much all using the control track for both particles and also other timelines. So if I unmute that, we have a big weather control uh, timeline track. We can bind that to our storm timeline. 
So as I scrub through in the editor, or actually let's click play, the day-night cycle will begin, and then you'll notice that all the lightning is going to take place. So we've stacked uh, two, three, four, five, well, each of those lightning strikes separate timelines. So you can see that you can stack lots of different timelines together to build up a more complex um, scene. And admittedly, it does actually look pretty cool when you're like, running around in lightning, rain. So let's go buy some fish whilst all these lightning strikes and stuff is taking place at the same time. So you can see that we're currently sequencing many, many things at the same time. And it's come back to our player, and then the day-night cycle loops in. And whilst it's raining, we can go to the dog. So you can see you can build up all these mini sequences all dotted around your environment, interact with them, or have them playing um, automatically. And it's pretty cool to actually scrub through and then pause it at specific points and then fly around and see all the rain and bits and pieces like that. Yeah, geez, oh, I feel really bad now, but yeah. So there's a, one or two other things I want to talk about or one or two things I want to show. And that's kind of a way of reusing timelines. Um, so one thing you might have a game is collectible items. You could have 10 different collectible items for like, uh, different power-ups or different speed boosts or different other elements. And what you may want to do is, rather than creating 10 timelines for each collectible, you may want to create one generic pickup item timeline and then reapply that across many items. And you can completely do that. And you can also style timelines in prefabs. So if you have collectible items that you spawn at runtime, or if you are a good developer, you use object pooling instead, you can um, store timelines on prefabs so they have their own mini timelines, and then spawn them, and then place them around and get them to reuse this uh, sequence. So let me turn off the day-night cycle and the storm, because uh, everything will be stacked together at this point. What we have here is I have a couple of prefabs um, of different collectible items. So if I select, I have this uh, nice hut, I guess. Um, I have this magnet as well. And I have this times two multiplier and this star object. So all of these are four collectibles you could collect in a, let's say, an endless runner or um, kind of any um, game where you have lots of different things that you pick up. Uh, another example is Zelda. You have lots of different items you can pick up on the ground. You don't want to create for 1,000 pickups 1,000 timelines, and then let's say you want to tweak a value. You have to go through all of them and change them. Instead, with all these pickups, you can create a timeline that's applied to all of them. So if we go down to, let's say, for example, uh, this star and select it, this star has two child empty game objects with timelines on them. Now, one thing to take into consideration timeline is that the timeline um, playable director can only be added to, uh, an object can only have one playable director, is what I meant to say. Um, Kind of like the animator, you can only have one on like an object. You can't have three or four animators. But what we can see here is as I select this idle timeline, we can have the little sequence of the star spinning. So we can actually preview what this looks like. And if I select the picked up timeline, you'll notice that the star increases. And then we have a particle system play, like you know when you hit something with a sword or you pick something up, just playing like so. So you see we have that fade out. If I go to my multiplier, it has exactly the same timelines on. It has the spin, and it also has the pickup. But the particles are slightly different. They're tinted very slightly different color. So you can actually make little changes, have exactly the same sequence, but make little subtle changes to the particles for this particular instance. Now, one thing you might notice, or one thing you kind of might be asking, is where do the timeline references actually uh, stay? What you'll see is that on this playable director, which is kind of the controller and the logic behind how the timeline plays, we have bindings. And these bindings link up to each of these sort of slots. Now, if you have a prefab and you spawn it into a scene and you want it to hook up its binding to some other object that may not necessarily exist yet or may exist later on, it's a more of a procedural game. So a lot of people create games where lots of things are spawned. You unfortunately cannot bind it to something that doesn't exist yet. What you can do, though, is there is a very simple API called set 
binding or set generic binding, and I'll show you the code at the end. It's very, very simple, which basically can find an object. You can reference this track and say, bind the player to this specific object. So as you spawn your collectibles, you can find the player and bind it. So you can actually set up your timeline with kind of empty references and then bind all of them to procedural content if, that your character creates or your character you know, um, may choose because you may have 50 characters in your game, but you don't know which one your player is going to choose in the player select screen. And when I mentioned that you can tweak this one timeline that's used across each of the gaps, uh, uh, the collectibles, sorry, um, that will apply that change um, to all of them. So you see here that we have this multiply by two pickup. And then as we scrub through, it shrinks. And then we kind of have this little star circle particle system that comes in a little bit too early. I want this to come in just at this point when it's at the uh, its uh, smallest. So what we could do is we could actually just select these, pull them up a bit, so we now actually have our sequence changed to it's a little bit better, right? Now, you notice that I changed it for this object. That data is then stored on the asset that's applied to all of the other um, collectibles. So if I go to this pickup and scrub through, you'll notice that Hey, presto, the change happens. You don't have to create, go to each collector and say, right, great, we now have to change this, this, this. You can kind of create a generic pickup and apply it to all the different pickup items um, in, your, uh, in your game. So if we now go into here, we have our pickups. Um, using that same timeline playback manager that I used for the dog and used for the NPCs and things like that, I could walk up to these and then trigger off a cutscene where our character picks it up and puts it in her pocket. So she has coffee, hearts, magnets, and stars in her pocket now. Um, so you can see that you can trigger off these mini timelines as she picks up an item and uh, kind of store this timeline and reuse it in many different ways. And similarly, if the timeline's on the prefab and you set up the code to basically bind it to the player, you can do things like uh, if I spawn all these collectibles, what they're going to do is, as they're spawns, they're going to say, find the player in the scene, bind it to this specific track. So it's actually going to find the player and bind it. So you can do runtime binding of different timelines. So I can go to the star, pick it up, go to this. I'm not going to pick up all of them. Of course, that's, that's silly. But you can see that we're reusing the same timeline over and over again. And you can tweak it, modify it, play around with it, use it in lots of different ways. So I have uh, nine minutes left. One thing I want to do, point out is that timeline is not supposed to be a replacement for our animator system. So we have our animator system, which has state machines and nodes where you transition from one state to another. And it's actually what our punk character does. Our punk character uses this state machine system um, called animator, or mechanism, as, as, as lots of people know it as, um, to run around and jump. Now, having these timelines doesn't replace all of this logic. You still use a state machine for things like running, jumping, and lots of local um, uh, sequences or local uh, control. The power of timeline is that you can hook it into lots of different elements. So like the day-night cycle, that was hooked into the lights, that was hooked into the skybox, that was hooked into lightning strikes, other timelines, rain, uh, other objects, and lots of different things. So timeline, think of it as kind of like a global animation system for pretty much anything in Unity. Um, and could potentially sequence kind of any different area um, of your game. Now, what happens is when our character, for example, goes into this little conversation with this guy, which shows off different camera cuts, is as the timeline plays, because our character's animator is bound to the timeline, the timeline will basically take dominance. So it'll actually say, OK, whatever state you're currently in, blend out of that into the timeline. And when the timeline finishes, it will blend back into the state. So the animator and the timeline blend quite well together, especially for cutscenes. So you could keep your logic of your character running, jumping, doing all these things, but then have the timelines kind of take control when they're played. And you don't have to write code to make them take control. So if I trigger this, she's then going to have a whole, this is a whole like, sequence that shows off different camera transitions. Those Zs above his head, she's a very polite punk, by the way. Um, those Zs above his head are also sequenced in timeline. I'm just like, yeah, so lazy. And then it will cut back to there. Now I can control it, because the timeline's finished. The animator takes dominance again. 
Uh, ooh, yep. That's pretty much the end of my demo so far. Um, this is kind of a small environment that I'm going to add a couple of other bits and pieces to and split them into different chunks. Um, I'm going to add it like as a link at the bottom of the video when it's recorded and uploaded, kind of saying, hey, download everything you've just seen. You can play around with it, hack it, uh, take it apart, you know, put the shark man in your game, put the dog in your game, or do whatever you like with it. Um, so I'll put that link at the bottom of the video when it's uh, recorded and, and uploaded. So the very, very complex API to play at a timeline is you reference it and do dot .play. Very tricky, right? The very complex API to get the duration of a timeline is that. You, get the, you go to the timeline and get the duration. So we try to make it so as simple as possible to get data from it. Now, this is the kind of the most code that you may have to write, is this, which is going to loop through all of the different timeline tracks. It's going to find a specific track. And then this magical line here, where we go to the timeline and set the binding, we set the binding of the track to the player. So if you have an animation track, you say, this object, this track, this object is now binded together. So whilst you can bind things there, you can also automate a lot of your processes if needed. Timeline's in 2017.1, which is uh, available in beta now. It's actually in release candidate phase now, uh, probably this morning. So we moved very, very quickly. Um, Cine Machine 2.0 is on the asset store. So all the group shots, the dolly paths, all those things, they're available to download right now, which is pretty cool. Um, Adam Myhill, who's our head of cinematics and master of cameras, which is not an official job title, but it might as well be for him, is going to do a how Cine Machine can revolution, uh, revolutionize your in-game cameras. That's tomorrow. It's the 2 PM slot, so everyone's hopefully sobered up after the party tonight for that, um, to hear about cameras. And I don't think you'll find another person who's more about cameras than Adam. And um, James Buckley, who's on our r and content team, um, he's doing a talk on extending timeline with your own playables. So this is going to be a very code-heavy talk about how you actually do the scripting for those little playable clips. So if you are a developer or you are a programmer, definitely attend that talk if you want to build your own tools on top of the sequencing system. Um, or even if you're just an artist who wants to go along and say, hey, can you uh, write me a tool so I can automate a conversation system or something like that? That's happening directly after Adam's talk, well, like half an hour after. Um, but that would be really, really interested if you're into that whole extending and extending unit and extending timeline direction. That's pretty much the end of my talk. So if you have any questions, I can answer questions for a couple of minutes. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, how much can we control the timeline by code? And I have two examples. One is how, how flexible it is for doing some branching in terms of uh, behavior. So I would say, yeah, the timeline should behave like this, but suddenly something happens and uh, I want to change a little bit the behavior. Would I call another timeline or could I jump inside the timeline or something like that? Um, so your first question was the, about so Sorry, how much control that. do you have over that? Like, oh, OK. So you, you, can you yeah. jump around, for instance? Do you have tools for that? And for instance, could I control the, um, the pacing of the timeline? OK. Like, I, could I, with movement, go backwards and forward so, with it? So with the API, you can do play, pause, stop, lots of different things. You can also get like the frame and set the frame. Mm -hmm. So oh. like, I don't like quick time events, but you could have like a moment that during it, you can then jump to a specific frame later mm -hmm. on. So you have control by scripts to jump to specific points. Mm -hmm. um, the other question was kind of branching timelines. So yeah. do you mean like in the middle of a sequence, you push a key and it does something else? Yeah. So you could do that a couple of ways. One is you could stop playing your current timeline and play the new branch at that specific point. Um, currently branching, you would have to script and add your different bits and pieces and kind of tweak it uh, yourself. But the system doesn't have kind of a branching logic in mm -hmm. the sense that you have track A, track B, and then you choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you could do is you could have path A, path B, and then you could enable or disable the play yeah. relevant playable director to yeah. play that other one. So via API, totally doable. But in editor without API, uh, probably not. You probably have to write some code. But because you have play, pause, stop, like all the very, all the very common things with them, um, any form of sequencing system, you mm -hmm. can do those things. But uh, if you do do that, please send me an email because yeah. uh, um, I'd like to see like kind of how you've done that and yeah, you true. know what your like end results are. Um, yeah. 
And just one quick question. Uh, when we're doing custom playables, can we do transitions also? Yes. Okay. And you can also specify what that transition actually controls between yeah, uh, exactly. the two clips. Yeah. Okay, cool. uh, I haven't used it yet, so maybe the question will be answered by the playables. But okay. I was wondering if there was something similar to the events you can find in animation clips. Ah, so. Uh, to, like an to, events track, like at this point, trigger yeah, off a function. At this point, okay. uh, trigger a function. So uh, this was a events track is a built-in track that we're working off of 2017.1. It didn't make it in because we wanted it to, to be working right rather than release something that kind of didn't work. And it's pushed back like a release or two. So it's not going to be in there yet. So the current workflow would be to either from a one behavior get the point in time like at five seconds in, trigger off this function. But a, play, a custom playable I wrote, um, which I can send to you, and I'll, I'll include in the project when it's on YouTube and things like that, um, is to have a playable that binds to an event system trigger. And then you use one of the event system trigger events to fire off what it actually does. So you kind of loop into the event trigger, and then that fires off the function. So it does exactly the same functionality, but you kind of go through one step. Okay. But the events track is definitely like on the plans and on yeah, the roadmap. It's on the roadmap. Too, but it won't be in 2017.1. Um, yeah. But uh, I'll include that event trigger thing in the project uh, when, it's, uh, when it's available. So yeah. OK, mm. thanks. So thank you for coming along. I hope it was insightful and interesting and uh, part of a showing you a little bit more sort of like features and a little bit more sort of uses and scenarios for timeline. Um, I'm going to be hanging around either the Ask the Experts bit, which is one of those white dome tents, or the main middle booth in the middle of the conference. If you want to come say hi, have questions, bits and pieces like that. So if you have any other questions, it says time's up on the thing right now. Um, if you have any other questions, just come out and say hi, and we can talk about timeline or all sorts of various other bits and pieces. So thanks for coming along. Um, cheers. <laughs>